in the office today. I'm um, continue to uh, admit folks. I see they're still coming in. So uh, we'll do that. And as folks are coming in, if you wouldn't mind just putting your name and affiliation in the chat box, I think we're going to do that today rather than everybody introducing themselves. Um, I'm Marty Koistra. I work for most all of you at the Housing Development Consortium, and we are really excited for today's presentation. Uh, I know that Aaron and Blockable have been in the space figuring out um, how to be uh, disruptive, to use uh, one of his terms, for some time to really help us think about how we overcome the crisis that we've had for quite a few years now. Um, and so today we get a chance to experience uh, through this very interesting format, uh, a real project and some real success in terms of making something happen. And so for the city of Auburn, our friends there, for our friends at Blockable, and of course, a uh, longtime ally and member Valley Cities, uh, this is going to be a, a, a very fun experience for all of us. And so I don't want to take up too much more time other than to continue to remind folks that we do have a fairly serious problem. Um, we had a net loss of 112,000 units of housing uh, affordable to households, zero to 80% AMI in the last decade, King County alone. Um, those units didn't disappear, they just lost their rent affordability. And so somehow or another, we have to get creative um, in terms of how we produce, how do we get product on the ground and on the market in a much different pace. And so um, we're really looking forward to today. And I think with that, Lauren, I'm turning it over to Aaron. All right, well, thank you, Marty, for that, that intro. Uh, I think I'm really looking forward to the presentation today. I really like, I love the hour and a half format because we have some time. So uh, we don't need to rush through. Uh, there's a lot to get into with this particular uh, case study as, as someone called it. Um, the way that this project was developed and built, I think has, is, is entirely new. Um, and we'll get into why that is and how that is um, in a bit. Um, just a little bit of a, you know, to set the stage, you know, we're talking about a small project. One of the things we'll talk about is why it's so different. Uh, it's a small project on purpose. Um, we've been very much building this up as a prototype type of approach. Um, there's a lot of things to, to move in order to really address affordability. We have, um, you know, our thoughts on how to do it, but it is a small project. Um, 12 units of housing for 30% AMI residents in Auburn, Washington, which is a community that very badly needs housing solutions. Um, it was financed by the state of Washington to be owned and operated by Valley Cities. Um, we're going to talk about the partners on this project. Uh, we're very lucky to have um, Gina, Gina from uh, Valley Cities, who I'll introduce in a moment, and uh, Jeff from the city of Auburn. We'll talk about the site and project history. We'll talk about our model, which is vertically integrated modular development, which is very different from any other type of modular approach you will have seen before. And then we'll get into some of the challenges and obstacles um, on the project. So some quick introductions. Gina Custer, from the, uh, who's the director of housing for Valley Cities, um, and Jeff Dixon, who's the planning services manager from the city of Auburn. Uh, very, you know, this was definitely a collaboration throughout. There were a lot of uh, moving parts. This was something no one had done before. And having, having sort of uh, really supportive, willing partners was a huge um, aspect to its success. The project is finishing now. It's looking, we're going to probably do a virtual ribbon cutting towards the end of October. Um, but it is kind of sliding into its finishing, uh, finishing stages right now. And I'm, I'm Aaron Holm and I'm the co-CEO of Blockable, if I haven't introduced myself already. Um, so overall, I also want to give credit to the other folks who were involved in this project. The structure of involvement was very different, but you'll recognize a lot of the, the 
the players. So we were the developer, which is very different. We were the developer and, and ran all aspects of development for the project. Uh, also Washington State Department of Commerce and Labor, of, and Labor and Industries were directly involved. Labor and Industries obviously has oversight for any uh, buildings that are factory built. City of Auburn, the architect was uh, SMR Architects. Um, MEP was by McKinstry, Civil was Springline Civil Engineering, Structural was Isle Gross. And the general contractor who's finishing up work on site was Charter Construction. Um, so with that, I, I'd love to sort of hand it over for a little bit to talk, to give some background uh, on, the, on the site, its history, uh, and sort of how we got to the sort of how we got to the, the starting line, if you will, <laughs> with, with the project, because one of our one of our caveats when we were first looking was, we, you know, we wanted to find a site where we could do a demonstration project. And there's there's a lot more complexity to that than you might think. Um, so, you know, the, the history of it and how we got to the start line was a really important aspect. So with that, I'll hand it over to Gina to talk a little bit about uh, Valley Cities. Great. Thank you, Aaron. Welcome everybody, it's nice to be a part of this team. Um, as you know, Valley Cities Counseling and Consultation has been around for over 55 years in South King County. And our mission is compassion, connection, and community. Which working within our mission, uh, we've seen the need in our community, like everyone, for affordable housing, especially for folks who suffer from behavioral health concerns. And especially in South King County, again, um, I think everyone can agree, South King County is a little overlooked and, and affordable housing is very important. Currently, Valley Cities manages 177 units of permanent supportive housing across South King County. And our goal with investing in blockables is to provide affordable housing for folks who would otherwise be homeless or rent burdened. We will be serving folks, like Aaron said, at, below, at, at or below 30% AMI. And although services are not connected to the blockable units at Valley Cities, uh, we saw that these units will have an opportunity for permanent housing for our graduates and for some of our other housing programs and for clients who are being seen in the clinics and have vouchers but are unable to find other housing where the rent is low enough to accept these vouchers. Again, we want to be able to open these up to the community. They won't just be for Valley Cities clients. I want to make sure that's really clear. Um, and Valley Cities chose to invest in blockables at this time for several reasons. Um, number one, there was available funding when we were finally ready to break ground on something through the Department of Commerce for a new pilot project. So that was a large factor. The second was the modular construction fit the site and our vision of more affordable housing. And blockables are easier and cheaper to build. Super important, as we all know. And they require less maintenance. And for us, the energy efficiency was very important and something we're all striving for. We're very excited to be launching uh, the opening of Blockables in the next month. So uh, from here, I'll hand it off to Jeff and he can talk more about the construction site in the city of Auburn. Great, thank you, Gina. It's really nice to be invited to be part of this presentation today. Um, from the city's perspective, uh, Valley Cities Counseling Consultation had proposed a group residence facility in two phases on a 8.08 acre site. Uh, the subject of this webinar focuses mainly on the second phase, but I'll, for context, I'll talk a little bit about the first phase too. So if you could advance the slide. Uh, to orient you, this project is part of Valley City's campus at uh, 26th Street Northeast and I Street Northeast. So it's north of cities downtown. And the second phase is to the east of the first phase that fronts on to I Street. Uh, to the northwest is the Valley City's administrative offices. And to the southwest, is a day shelter uh, that's part of a uh, partnership between Valley Cities and the City of Auburn. And then further to the south is a Valley Cities uh, veteran supportive housing project as well. Um, the neighborhood is characterized as, in, as a transition in land use from commercial and multifamily along the north-south arterials of I Street Northeast and Auburn Way North and uh, becomes lower density to, to the neighborhoods to the east. And there is also an elementary school to the southeast of the project. The comprehensive plan designation for the property is high density, re density residential. 
and the zoning for the property is R20. So it is a higher density residential uh, zoning designation. Um, and in this zoning district, group residence facilities do require a conditional use permit. So if I could have you advance to the next slide. I want to, this is the dry part of the presentation. You'll have to bear with me because only the planners might appreciate this. But to provide some context, I'd like to describe a little bit about the land use approval process that went on for both phases and then focus in on the second phase. So in December of 2012, Valley Cities applied for a land use approval of a conditional use permit for 36 residential units. Um, and it was proposed to be constructed in two phases, 24 units as the first phase and 12 units as the second phase. Um, the hearing was, after some delays, the hearing was conducted in 2014. Hearing examiner conducted the public hearing and issued a decision approving that conditional use permit with five conditions. Uh, in 2016, Valley Cities applied for their civil improvements including some street frontage improvements, utility improvements, drainage, um, and those plans were approved in 2015 and construction com was commenced and was completed in 2016. Um, also in 2016, three building permits were applied for for the first phase of the development. These permits were issued in 2016 and construction commenced and was accepted as completed in the very beginning of 2017. Uh, next slide. Yep, we're there. Okay. Um, then in focusing on the second phase, uh, in June of 2016, uh, Valley Cities applied for their building permits for the second phase. Those were reviewed and issued also in 2016. However, there was no start of construction and the building permits and the conditional use permit both expired in 2016. Um, next slide. So this is a little, maybe a little hard to see on this screen, but it's just a site plan for the development that shows um, the arrangement of the two groupings of buildings on the east side of the site. And it also shows that the parking lot was done, a shared parking lot between the two phases was completed as part of the first phase and also shows you that the second phase does have street frontage onto the east-west 26th Street Northeast at the south end of the site. Uh, next slide. Then to focus on the land use approval process for the second phase in 2019, uh, Valley Cities and Blockables applied for the conditional use permit for the second phase since we had to go through that process again for the additional 12 units. And later in January of 2019, that CUP was issued. And this CUP process was also simultaneous with an amendment of the administrative architectural design review process for the project. So while the site preparation was largely completed as part of the first phase, there was also a few remaining civil improvements. And so there was a civil approval application and uh, approval to move a water line out of the way for the construction and to complete some of the remaining segments of public sidewalk associated with the right of way. The building permits for footings and the decking were applied for in May of 2019 and issued in August of 2019 and then uh, the foundations and footings for the project were inspected as well. Next slide. So uh, 
the advertisements for this webinar talked about that there would be some discussion of challenges. And I guess from the city's perspective, I'd like to jump in a little bit with some of the challenges. Um, it was unfortunate because of the long partnership that the city of Auburn has with Valley Cities that uh, we had to redo the conditional use permit process and the building permit process for phase two since they had expired. Um, we also needed to revisit the administrative architectural design review process for the project, uh, considering some changes that reflected a different design for the second phase, uh, different than the first phase, but it did maintain the single story component of that and it continued to reflect a, a street appeal by the use of um, front uh, building front decks that resembled a kind of porch appearance, um, individual covered entries over the entries to each individual unit of the 12. So it was an opportunity for uh, the city to look at a new prototype project and the city was excited about partnering on this particular project. So with that, Aaron, I'll turn it back to you. Great, thank you, Jeff. So we've had a um, sort of good conversation. We'll get into some of the additional challenges uh, a little bit later. Um, so I'm gonna now go through sort of the, the development process and, and how we viewed this project from the blockable side. Um, so I'll start by, first of all, kind of describing the traditional modular process and, and sort of why it's um, structurally not really made much of a dent in some of the core crises that, that it's meant to address. So, you know, a lot of people talk about modular as innovation, and I think modular on its own is not particularly innovative. It's, it's generally seen as a process to replace the framing element of construction. Um, so I heard something, I was on a, um, a webinar a few months back, and an architect was talking about the role of modular um, and she said you know there's infinite demand for affordable housing and so there's infinite demand for modular but at the same time uh, modular factories don't open up and stay in business in washington because there's not enough demand and you have to think about the the juxtaposition of that statement um, because it's largely a structural issue so i'll kind of go through some of the core issues with modular as it's currently thought of um, as a construction technique for the industry and why it's really not I, we don't think position to make much of a, a difference. So first of all, I mean, modular tends to sell to developers on a project by project basis. So developers aren't really looking for modular as a product, they're looking for cheaper framing. Um, and so what they do is they create a commodified set of drawings and then shop it across multiple factories to see who will give them the best price. Um, so there's no, the factory itself has no ability to create a repeatable system because they're basically responding to uh, quote requests by uh, architects who have developed something that any factory can build. So by definition, the industry is a job shop industry, right? So you have job by job, they build snowflakes. So they build individual projects with no repeatable architectural, structural, mechanical systems engineering. And that's really where the complexity of building comes from. It's not in the wooden box itself, it's in all the systems that attach to that that need to be, you know, meet code and pass inspection and meet performance requirements. So the modular builders generally are structured that they have to make all of their money on project margin, but they're being beat up by the industry to deliver the project as cheaply as possible. The industry looks at modular factories and says, it's your job to figure out how to make housing cheaper. And then they're confused when the modular manufacturers go out of business because they generally ride the real estate wave. So as framing gets more expensive, more modular manufacturers come online. As the industry tanks, uh, then modular manufacturers go out of business because the framers reduce their prices. So in that model, there's no money for R&D and there's no ownership in the real estate, which means there's no incentive to innovate. So if you look at modular construction, it's not really all that innovative. You move the labor and the materials inside, um, and then you build the buildings out to a very basic level of completion. Um, and it's a race to the bottom for who can build the cheapest, cheapest box, typically the cheapest wooden box. So what we wanted to show in Auburn was to prototype a new paradigm for development. So we call it vertically integrated modular development. And what that means is the building system 
is, is serves the development model. So we're very focused on infill, middle density housing development, both market rate and affordable. So our business model is something that we've created so that there's a commitment always and ongoing to affordable housing. But it's a similar typologies because we can create this standardized system that's really optimal for, we'll call it one to five stories, single loaded, double loaded, uh, either ground up or over podium, garden construction, uh, mixed use. Uh, it's a really wide variety of typologies that can be served by the same building system. Um, and so what we wanted to showcase in Auburn was sort of the, the first level of uh, building connected engineering, which means we connected these buildings horizontally, which opens up a whole other set of issues around fire separation and code. So the goal was to find a site where we could um, demonstrate the building system, but also, you know, be the developer and, and sort of manage all aspects of that, because that's crucial to creating an incentive model for housing innovation. So the only way the only way to really incentivize investment in systems that are going to reduce the cost of bringing housing online is for the, the owner of that innovation to be the real estate developer because the performance of the real estate is where all of the upside equity creation happens. And that's how the incentive model works. And that's how you can, that's how you can stimulate investment in, in R and D. So looking more deeply at the development model, first looking at the role of modular. So the modular innovation uh, is really more, more robust and comprehensive when it services the vertically integrated development. So by reducing cost and risk and simplifying roles and responsibilities, we make more efficient developments. And because we can do that, that allows us to create equity. And on the market rate side, that means that we're creating real estate that we own a larger piece of because we've reduced the cost to build. And on the not-for-profit side, it means that we reduce the need for public subsidy because we can build at lower cost. So by doing that, um, again, we're creating equity on the market, market rate side, we're reducing subsidy on the affordable side. We're also creating a vehicle for private investment. So we've brought in you know, tens of millions of dollars into the company from the private side, from investors who are looking at the value of, of really creating efficiency in the housing development model. Um, and then on the product development side, and so product development is very different than project development. In a typical project, there's really no money to invest in innovative methods. And for modular manufacturers, them having to make all of their margin on a project by project basis means that there's no money to really do things all that differently. For us, we're really investing in the repeatable components, the assemblies, performance, um, and also a platform to validate new approaches. So we're always doing product development. Auburn, you know, if you look at the engineering that was in Auburn, that's about two year old, two and a half year old engineering because of the time that it takes to get through the actual build process. And in this case, because we were setting so many precedents in terms of the development, the project took a while, but we knew it would take a while. And it was really done for a reason, which was to validate our assemblies, to validate our labor model, validate our materials, validate the assembly process, and to validate the cost structure. With that now, we've moved on, you know, already a year and a half ago, we started engineering on an entirely new building system, which was an evolution beyond what we did in Auburn, now moving to a five-story structural system with no shear wall um, and a standardized bathroom and a standardized set of floor plans. So that product development approach um, only works if you're the vertically integrated developer because you need to be driving it all the way from the site acquisition process. So the only way to really leverage investment in modular is to be looking at viable sites right from the start, not as not as a bidding process later on when all of that work has already happened. That's what allows us to compound uh, the value of the innovation itself. So this was a sort of snapshot in time. This was way back, um, I don't even know at this point, several years ago when we first visited the site. So this is what the, uh, this is what the, the dirt looked like. It was a mound of dirt, which was to be the phase three of the, of the Phoenix Rising site. And so this was one of our first trips down there as we were taking a look and trying to figure out what we could build there. Um, this is a shot along the way as Valley, as a charter prepared the site. One of the, the features of our system and something that we're constantly working on is really simplifying the site work. So making sure that there's an absolute minimum of site work and that the, the handoff, logistics handoff from the buildings as they're craned off of the trucks onto the site 
is repeatable um, and, and the general contractor has a very clear scope of work and understands exactly how to connect the buildings, um, put them together and take them from um, the, the sort of 95% complete you know, uh, form factor that they're in coming out of the factory into completed you know, C of O um, housing. And this is another look at one of the early renderings uh, on the project and, and in the end they'll look almost identical to this. They'll, it'll be a beautiful, very small, beautiful community. Um, so one of the things I really wanted to highlight in this uh, webinar was it's a small project. This is 12 units of housing, um, but the, the building, the, the what and the how of how this project came together, I think is really notable and really worth um, sharing. So first of all, these are long-term useful life buildings. So these are 50 to 100 year useful life buildings, um, structural steel, uh, non-combustible materials, we use repeatable assemblies, which means if you look at these buildings in the factory, the plumbing, electrical, floor assemblies, envelopes, everything is identical building to building, like 16th of an inch tolerance, identical buildings, which means there's far less room for error. We have, you know, uh, jigs that we put in place for building. We have, um, you know, when, when, when we're doing the plumbing, it's identical in every single building. So we get repeatable, um, dependable levels of performance and it reduces a lot of the risk on the build. Um, we're also permanent steel construction. So these are not temporary buildings. These are permanent to permanent code, um, long-term useful life buildings. We also are implemented smart monitoring for power and water systems. So because these are zero energy buildings, we've, test, we've done blower door tests on these buildings at three points through the development because we're partnered with the National Renewable Energy Lab and we wanted to be able to model the energy performance on the buildings throughout. So, you know, we believe that we're going to see significant reductions in utility costs. And so we're measuring the power consumption so that we can compare it against on a per square footage basis against the other buildings that are already on site. And these are engineered and built for long term ownership. So we built these as owners. So because we're developers and on the market rate side, we're looking to increase our performance, reduce the maintenance costs, reduce the insurance cost, increase the net operating income, that perspective informs product development, which means everything that we do on the building system side, we're doing uh, from the perspective of an owner. So in the not-for-profit work, what that means is we can deliver buildings that are lower cost to operate, which is obviously a huge importance for, for not-for-profits. From the process side, this was a design build project. So, you know, we were, you know, fully in control from the beginning. It was also a prevailing wage project, ESDS and publicly financed. So because it was financed by the state through the Department of Commerce, it meant that we were you know, obligated to, to hit all of, those, um, all of those requirements from the state auditing perspective. So we, we did that. Uh, we also leveraged a lot of private investment in the, building, in the building system. So north of $20 million from private investors um, to really help us sort of build out our engineering um, capabilities as well as uh, early prototyping to get us to the point where we were validating with the Valley Cities build things that we wanted to see in the product development perspective. Um, and so what we've created is sort of a platform for a platform and an incentive model for continuous cost reduction. So as we scale and increase our building output, um, the costs continue to come down. So I'll show uh, a quick sort of drone uh, shot from our factory. This was in, I think this was in March of uh, this year in, in what we're calling um, the before times. <laughs> so this was, uh, you know, a, a look at what our factory was up to in March as we were kind of finishing these buildings off. And so we're using, you know, this is a coal roll form machine that we use to create all of our non-structural steel components. It's used a lot in aviation and automotive. Uh, it's a really cool machine that really gives us a lot of control over our prototyping process, allows us to create very precise assemblies with part numbers, with pre-cut notches for all the different uh, connection points that we want to put in place. Um, so we use a number of machines like this that really uh, pr provide a high level of precision, but also, you know, we're on to, I think, you know, version 10 or 11 of our structural system at this point. So the structural system itself is, is very mature. This is a view of one of our plumbing assemblies. So you look at the, you know, this, it's the exact same plumbing assembly in every building. So with every building, we're implementing the exact same uh, sort of components, electrical runs, plumbing assemblies. This is a water jet machine that we use to cut um, some new materials. So we use things like um, 
we use a, 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 an antibacterial material in the bathroom that cleans the indoor air. And we've been able to experiment with some materials like that. So we finished the buildings to 95% in the factory, which means that we have a high degree of sort of predictability and performance. Um, then I'll show quickly a, a drone shot of uh, the first round of building installation. So when we put the buildings in place, uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a logistics effort, right? Sort of the factory 60,000 square feet in Vancouver, Washington, um, shipping the buildings out, staging them overnight so that we have a constant install cadence uh, for the general contractor to crane the buildings into place. So these were the one bedrooms that were being craned on the site. And again, the buildings are identical, process is identical. Um, so it becomes something that's very repeatable um, in the process, the buildings ship to site waterproofed, um, and then you know they're they're dropped into place by the GC. Uh, so you know the the install process is pretty it's pretty neat to watch, but you're it's really a lot more about trucking and craning and insurance <laughs> than it is about construction. You're talking about you know liability handoff, uh, you know providing buildings, lifting up you know like a thirty thousand pound building and dropping it onto a 16th of an inch point that's been pre-engineered on the foundation side and then sort of dropping that into place and finishing it off. So um, this part of it was, uh, was, was went very well. Uh, the site work again was minimal. So what it does is it, it creates a very sort of neat site. So there's these kind of funny elements within the ESDS process. One of them that I found funny was that there's a whole set of regulations around ensuring that the construction site is not messy, right? So that there's not a lot of waste and not a lot of excess, you know, stuff happening on the construction site. And then you, you look at this construction site and basically the buildings just pop into place. Uh, and then we have some finishing work to do. So it was interesting communicating, you know, how, how non messy the construction site was during the ESDS audit process. And then I'll mention one other thing on the buildings. So this is um, a shot from I guess about three weeks ago, we, we shipped a building over to the National Renewable Energy Lab. And so this was the first generation of prototypes, which we did. There's one up at the Edmunds Lutheran Church. There's another that's going as a, a, a completely net zero project in East Palo Alto. And then this was the one building that had previously been used as a quarantine unit for an accessible quarantine unit by the Department of Health in Centralia. Um, to quarantine COVID uh, patients who, who required an accessible unit. Once that need was finished, uh, then we shipped it off to Golden, Colorado, where it's now with the National Energy, National Renewable Energy Lab, who we're partnered with. And this allows us to do scenario modeling on the buildings. So we can use different water pump systems, different HVAC systems, different exterior materials, and really measure the relative energy performance in snow load in cold weather, in hot weather. And so it's a really ideal facility. And NREL, because of their testing capacity, can instrument the building with really precise, accurate, and advanced uh, measurement systems to tell us a lot about the performance of the building. This allows us to model uh, entire, entire process. So if you look at what we're doing from a sort of 60 BIM perspective, you know, because we're the developer, we're modeling energy performance all the way from site selection through massing through completion, but then also ongoing once the buildings are in place, we're able to measure their energy performance. So we have a full life cycle view of, of energy and Auburn's a really important starting point in that project because what we're, this building tells us the performance of an individual enclosed envelope, 260 square foot studio. The Auburn project will tell us about what happens when we combine buildings and create multi-building assemblies. And so that's an important data point for us as well. So in all of this, I've kind of talked a lot about the, the development structure. I'll show this quick video, which just sort of explains from a financing perspective, the importance of driving down cost and how we've created an incentive model for that. So as, as we drive down the total cost for development, not just the cost of the construction or the blocks, but the total per door cost of development, on the market rate side, what that allows us to do is to remove the need for outside equity, right? By removing the need for outside equity and on the not-for-profit side, removing the need for subsidy. So it creates a benefit because on the market rate side, we create real estate that we own more of, that we have a greater equity position in because we're, we're building the only product in the world that appreciates in value when it goes out the door because it's, it's legally 
real estate. It's connected to the land, which means the most valuable component of it is the equity position, which on the market rate side is what we leverage. On the not-for-profit side, by building at lower cost, we deliver at lower cost. So we're building at a cost plus 10% model for the not-for-profit side, which means that our cost, as it goes down, that cost goes down for the not-for-profits and for the public uh, partnerships that we create. So that's a, just a look at you know, how that value is recognized. So in terms of challenges, um, there were many, many, many challenges along the way. Um, so first of all, everything that we did was setting a precedent. Like this just hadn't been done before. Typically any project, particularly a publicly financed project, the only way that modular is involved is if modular is selected as a commodity input into a partnership process where there's an architect, general contractor, uh, developer, um, and engineering. And then the, the, the modular is kind of an after, afterthought. So I've kind of watched this process happen as the state and the county have announced different funding sources for modular. And typically, you know, you folks reach out to you and the only thing they want to know from the modular folks is, you know, what's your, what's your cost, right? So what's, what's your cost? Because then they'll plug it into everything else that they're doing. So our process was, was very different. The first challenge for us was to find a site. And we were, you know, very fortunate. The, the county assessor's office, uh, John Wilson and, and Ed Walker, we're really interested in the model. And so they, they introduced us to Valley Cities and we, they said, you know, look, I think they might have a site down there that could be useful for this. So from then there, we had to establish the development model, which meant, well, Valley Cities was used to working in a partnership with their architect and their general contractor. Um, and so we, we said, all right, well, we'll take a look at that. And so we provided our quote based on the buildings and then sent it out to the, the GC and the architect. And when it came back, it was $800 a, a foot and nothing, nothing had been added. It was just a whole bunch of contingencies and added fees and stuff. We said, well, why are we doing this? So, you know, the way that we, we uh, arranged the financing for of it was, you know, we couldn't participate in an RFP process because we were the developer and uh, the RFP process requires a partnership structure during the RFQ, which means you have to say, okay, who are the folks that are gonna work on this? And it requires a design bid build process. And so for us, ours was design bid or design build and that's design build would not qualify for any RFP, which meant that the public financing for this project needed to be a direct appropriation. And so uh, we were fortunate enough that there was a, a, a line item that was created in the budget for innovative housing. And part of that was allocated directly to Valley Cities, which meant that by law, uh, that project could be financed. So you know, having the, the public financing obviously was a, a key part to it. We, we raised many multiples of the public financing with private investment, but the public financing was important because we wanted to demonstrate the overall process. Um, the clarity, clarity and consistency in the code interpretation was really a challenge uh, because there were a lot of, you know, aspects of how labor and industries interpreted um, the site that led to delays. And so we had, a, we had a five to six month delay in the factory as we were waiting for confirmation of the labor and industries interpretation. And when you're sitting on labor and machinery and rent on a factory that's, that's not, produce, not producing any output, I mean, that's, that's really expensive. Um, so that was a big challenge. Accessing the financing was a challenge because the Department of Commerce had never dealt with an entity like us. And so we had to set a whole lot of precedents around how are the buildings treated, um, how are the drawdowns happen. And so the, one, of the big, one of the big things, and I'll get to it in a moment, were the contracts, because the contracts were all, all new. So another challenge was, uh, you know, as Jeff mentioned, the CUP expiration, that kind of came as a surprise. We, didn't, we hadn't been tracking it, but then once we sort of realized that it had happened, then we we worked with the city and with, uh, with SMR architects to get the CUP back on track and had the hearing and that was successful. Um, I think labor and industries, there are two sides to the labor and industries process. The one side is the review and the evaluation, which, which had its challenges because of the treatment of the units themselves. Um, but honestly, the inspection process was seamless and easy. So I think what labor and industries really appreciated was how, uh, how repeatable our buildings are. So when they come and they inspect um, the buildings in our plant, they see exactly what's in the engineering. And then they also see that each building is exactly the same, which from an inspector's perspective is, is pretty attractive because there's not really, there, there's nothing different about them because we're, we're prototyping for manufacturing, which means we want repeatability. We want the exact same and we're laser, laser measuring everything. So uh, that's all there. 
ESDS was a bit of a challenge just because they, they're just used to their audit process is tailored towards site construction and the manufacturing process is very different. So we needed to create some different, um, different separation there. And then the contracts, I mean, we built this on a guaranteed maximum contract to Valley Cities, which meant that Valley Cities had essentially no risk in the project and had a guaranteed price. So we had a guaranteed maximum contract with Valley Cities, which said, we will deliver to you these 12 units of housing at this level, um, at this cost, and that's the end of it. And so that's to us is, is the model for this because it shouldn't be prescriptive about how or what they are or what the team is or any of that. It should just be, okay, here's the price, here's the quality, here's the performance. It's up to us to figure it out. The risk is on us. Um, and, that, and then from there, Valley Cities had a contract with the Department of Commerce. And so the flow was, you know, we would organize all the work, we would organize all the billings, and then we would, uh, Valley Cities would draw down from the Department of Commerce allocation and then pay us for the project. Um, and it was, it was it's all gone very seamlessly, but all the contracts were brand new. The contract structure didn't exist, which meant we had to invent it all and work part, closely with our attorneys to do that. Um, so I'll just say, we're kind of coming to the end, but uh, with a traditional approach, this project would have failed many times along the way. It would have failed in the initial financing. It would have failed um, in the initial design phase. Uh, it would have failed um, when it was, was held up by labor and industries. It would have failed in figuring out how to negotiate with the general contract. I mean, it just would have failed any number of times. And Scott Starr, who was the lead architect from SMR, was kind enough to sort of send me a note uh, on what he felt the challenges were, which were largely regu regulatory. Um, and so sort of looking at this unique method of project delivery, the impact it on the finance and the SDS and permitting. And he was, you know, his perspective was what helped was Blockable was fully committed to the project. And so we committed the time, money, uh, resources, people, everything to overcome the problem. Because from our perspective, we were going to drive this through regardless. And that's where, I, where I'm speaking to that model of vertically integrated modular development, that perspective is the key, being able to drive it all the way through. So some of the things, you know, Marty was mentioning the, the deficit, the growing deficit in affordable housing, which I think is, is there's no, unless the model substantially changes, there's nothing that's gonna, gonna change that. There's too many gatekeepers in this industry. There's too many people between the renter who needs a lower rent and the ability to bring housing online that costs less to rent. There's far too many gatekeepers and there's far too many people in the process who are brokering uh, different levels of service and not actually building anything. Nobody's investing in R&D. Affordable housing developers do not invest, invest in R&D and they have no control over price. So ultimately there's a layer of bureaucracy on top of the typical development process that drives up the cost. And there's no incentive for new business models because Everything is based on, you know, the existing uh, pool of affordable housing developers. And so we've seen this in places like Los Angeles, where they issue a $1.2 billion bond to address homelessness. And the per door build cost goes from $350,000 a door to $550,000 a door on average over three years, because you have not increased the supply in the marketplace. You've simply added a whole bunch of money into it. And what that does is it ups the cost of scarce resources. So all the money in the world won't fix housing. We've got a, we posted something on our blog that's a perspective on this. Feel free to go and read it. It's really just about how the industry works and why more money for that industry won't, won't change it. Um, and the traditional approach, the other key takeaway is the traditional approach to financing and building modular will not produce meaningful efficiencies or cost reduction. So it's not gonna change anything. And this idea that somehow modular is on its own um, you know, a panacea is, is not true. And modular as it's currently structured is generally just a commodity input um, on pricing. And so, you know, those modular businesses will have a hard time even, even staying afloat. A few recommendations I thought I'd throw out. Uh, one is uh, design build responses should be allowed for, for public, uh, public financing for either innovative or modular housing RFPs. So the, the goal should be to establish the cost and performance, not, not define the team structure. Uh, second is that um, we should require the projects for that type of innovative or modular housing build below fully loaded costs uh, for the project's respective location. So build costs are very different in different places. And so if you issue a statewide RFP and say it's gotta be at a certain dollar value, 
um, you know, that's going to be really challenging for anything to be built in Seattle. It might be possible in more rural areas, but you're not really addressing the key issue, which is the fully loaded development cost. The goal should be to drive it down below market cost in, in respective markets. And then the final one is that, you know, anybody who's, who's sort of selling innovation should be able to show how their model uh, reduces costs increasingly at scale. So those, that's just our perspective on things that we think tangibly should happen uh, in terms of the public financing aspect of it. Um, so with that, I hope I haven't run too far over time. Um, maybe I have, but I don't have a clock in front of me. So with that, I think we can open it up to any questions for, for Gina or Jeff or myself. And I just wanted to personally just say thank you again to Gina and Jeff. Um, it's been really fun sort of working on this, um, on the, both on the project and on, on this webinar. Check Great. Thanks, Aaron. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, we do have a couple of questions um, coming in the chat. So I think we'll just kind of go um, start with Mike and, and go down until we run out of time. Um, so uh, Aaron, this first question is for you from Mike Steffen. Um, and it's that you mentioned a guaranteed maximum price. What was the construction contract value and what was the construction cost per unit? Well, it's, you know, I, I don't want to share what the cost was. I think, you know, we had a GMAX contract. It wasn't the construction. It was the all in, all in development cost for everything. So our all in development cost to Valley cities was equal to the allocation, the appropriation that had been provided by the Department of Commerce, which was $1.5 million. So on a public financing basis, it was $125,000 a door. That was the cost from blockable to Valley Cities and from Valley Cities to the Department of Commerce. So that was the full allocation that was provided by the state. And that was the only public financing. Now, we invested a lot of money um, to make the project happen, but that's outside of, of anything that was done contractually. And then um, the follow-up question for Gina is about the total development cost per unit. Um, Aaron, I'm guessing that's going to be the 125,000 per door. Same. Right? It's the same same number. I mean, I think Valley Cities okay. Okay. Valley Cities might have incurred a couple things along the way that just had to do with like site improvements. So there were a couple things with like you know the sidewalk and moving a lot. Those were just general condition improvements, but they were they're really minor. Uh, the next question is from Mark, who uh, wants to hear more about the optimization that you're doing at the factory and the kit of parts level to make the assembly stitch processes easier. Sure. Well, I mean, there's, there's many concurrent processes that are happening. Uh, so imagine a product development process that includes our structural systems, our electrical systems, mechanical systems, assemblies. So you have you have two aspects of it. You have the build, right, which are the buildings themselves, which are, you know, uh, structurally integral uh, volumetric building units that are structurally rated up to five stories, including five stories over a podium um, that, you know, require no shear wall and can provide floor plans for studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, three bedrooms, affordable housing, uh, market rate, multifamily, student housing, senior housing, co-living, uh, all of those with single uh, bathroom module, you know, components. So that's the, those are the general aspects of the building system that we optimize for. Um, and I would say that at this stage, you know, for instance, this is the last build that we'll do for a good year and a half. So right now we're back into a, a deep phase of research and development and engineering on the building system. We know the things that we need to get to, but this is the disconnect between sort of the industry's expectations and what really needs to happen in modular. There's a ton of engineering that needs to be done before we invest in the next phase of manufacturing equipment. So what typically happens is a factory stands itself up and it goes to build a project and then it goes to build like a 200 unit, 300 unit project. There's a whole bunch of mess along the way because it's really complicated to build a 200, 300 unit project. And so the modular factory continues to scope back its work and ends up just delivering the simplest thing it possibly can, realizes it's made a bunch of mistakes and now it's got to go back through and retool the factory, which is a huge capital expense. So if you want to keep doing that, you'll be out of business very shortly. So for us, 
Um, the optimization of the approach is about picking the highest priority problems and going after those first. So if the most mature thing in our building system is our structural system. So how do we create the structural framing um, for a volumetric modular unit that can be assembled and laser uh, precise and accurate within, you know, and we have different, different bars that we've hit for each build in terms of number of minutes that it takes between when we receive the steel to when the frame is completed. Um, then obviously a wall assemblies, floor assemblies, plumbing assemblies, electrical assemblies. So we think of it in systems. And then we think of the innovation that we're doing in product development on each of those systems. The first thing that we really went after was structural. After we got through structural, then it was really about the envelope and the building assembly because we knew we wanted to create a very high performance, energy efficient building assembly. So one of the things, for instance, that we've done is we focused a lot on air exchange. So if you look at the Valley Cities buildings, you can walk in, three people can walk into one of those buildings and in 10 minutes, the temperature will go up between a degree and a degree and a half. And that's simply because of the thermal, the, the air tightness of the building itself. So we do more with energy efficiency by exchanging the air than we do by blasting the HVAC system all the time. So that was, we spent a lot of time working on the envelope performance and the energy efficiency. Um, and now we're really into, um, you know, simplifying the bathroom assemblies. You know, it's one of these things you, you can run an entire schedule and then get to the point where you've got to tile the bathroom and, you know, that's really slow. <laughs> so, so having uh, one of the things that we're focused on now is identifying the highest priority um, sub assemblies that we can have pre manufactured before they get to the plant so that we're not making everything. So if we can receive um, certain components that are already ready made to our specifications, then it makes the assembly process. You think about, you know, think about a company like Boeing, right? When Boeing's making airplanes, um, they're not, they're not making the entire airplane. They're assembling from a, a network of uh, supply chain providers in the area that are sending them per specification, the engines, the seats, the floors, all of it comes in and they manage the assembly process, the quality control, um, and the overall overall business. But over time, that's what needs to happen in this industry, which is really setting it up as, as a supply chain manufacturing industry. But we're just, we're in like, you know, we're not even in the batter's box yet. This is this is just all starting. So um, we're, yeah, next, next stage, we're very much focused on sub-assemblies um, as well as the, we have proprietary IP around how we uh, connect our nodes together. So the structural connectors and the nodes that allow us to both connect buildings horizontally and vertically, and then also connect them to the site in such a way that um, is fast and, um, and, and easy to review and approve from a regulatory engineering perspective. Great. Um, next question is uh, from Mike to everyone um, regarding the overall time um, to deliver. So uh, what would you consider the date of project conception and then what's the anticipated date of completion or turnover? Well, I can, I'll take a crack at it. I mean, I think that it's, again, it's, so some of these questions are sort of coming from the perspective of, of like how you might typically look at evaluating sort of modular for a project. And again, it's not, I mean, we prototyped for months and months and months and months on purpose. We were, from our perspective, we were not measuring, um, you know, how fast can we get the buildings out the door, right? The first question in this process is what are you building? If you're just building to the standard architectural specifications, then yeah, you can, you can figure out how fast and how many you can build. So that's the sort of caveat initial answer. Um, secondly, though, I think from the first time we saw the site was probably two and a half years ago. Um, we first looked at the site. Gina, I don't know if you have a different timeline on it, but. I think that would be correct. It's been a journey. Yeah. Uh, between COVID and, and like you said, all the planning that, there's a lot of planning that goes along through the process. So um, it may go quicker the next time. It's really hard to say, and I'm sure Aaron can speak to that, but um, certainly COVID put a little kink in it as well. Yeah, think about that. We talked about all the challenges of this project and we didn't mention COVID, right? And COVID shut down our factory for weeks, 
because we, we wanted to make sure that we could provide a safe work environment. And for a while, we weren't totally sure. And one of the things was the project itself qualified for the exemption because it was a publicly financed low income housing project. So we did not have to shut down the build. So the site work was able to continue, the manufacturing work was able to continue, but the entire supply chain shut down. And uh, I think the city, I don't know, Jeff, if you, if the city shut down, it was fully shut down for a while. I, I don't remember. Well, we had the, um, yes, the essential activities like publicly financed low income housing could continue. Um, but, and then we were accommodating that with inspections, but then we've, as things have ramped up, we've uh, adjusted and instituted certain safety protocols to continue work and to support inspections and permitting. So, yes. Yeah, I think the biggest, so, uh, we had a four month delay when the CUP expired. We had a six month delay when Labor and Industries was sort of rendering a, a, a verdict on the classification of the, of the kitchens. <laughs> um, and then we had, you know, we had a six to eight month delay when the Department of Commerce was working out its, its onboarding process because our business model was so different. And so, you know, we, we had one of these fun delays where basically we had received the full punch list of, of materials that were required from the Department of Commerce for us to create a, a funding source to draw down on. And I think, you know, it was probably two or three months when we were hearing that it would be there the next week, there the next week, and it never was. And then when they were ready to issue it, um, their year turned over and their guidelines changed. And so then we needed to go back through them and kind of evaluate them again. So that's just standard stuff. So if you look at, you know, the actual build <laughs> was fast. The, the, the challenge in this process is not, you know, it's kind of a, a catch 22 a little bit, like the rest of the process is where all of the delays happened. And none of them had any material impact on the build that was done. Nothing changed our engineering, nothing changed our process, nothing changed what was and en what ended up getting delivered. It was just about the process of navigating um, that entire, you know, all of those steps. Um, but at the same time, I mean, the truth of it is all of the other steps are actually the easy part. The hard part is actually the build. So the hard part, if you look at why costs are so high for housing development, the rest of it costs a lot of money, but it's really the shortage of providers who can actually build the housing, right? Like how many providers are there that can, at the end of the day, design, build and put in place housing that can be inspected, meets code, um, and, and can be you know, delivered at a price that matches um, what they're gonna rent for because that's what'll drive the entire financing of it. That, the market of folks who can do that is small. So it's ironic because like the build is the hard thing, but at the same time in the project, it was all of the other things and not the build that caused uh, delay. Um, the next question is from Jamie about um, the final project and if there are pictures available of that or wherever it is um, in the process. And then also, how did you address specific city design standards? Well, it's a good segue because if you want. Um, so we're going to be doing a virtual ribbon cutting uh, at the end of October. So we have... Um, we have some folks coming in for, you know, it's a challenge doing ribbon cuttings in the time of COVID. So <clears throat> we're gonna do a virtual ribbon cutting at the end of October. If, if you'd like, just, I guess, put your name in the chat or I can just send an invite to anybody who's, who's participated today. Um, so that, that'll, that'll, we'll have, you know, landscaping will be done. We'll have the, the final interiors, everything will just be finished out. Um, so we'll be able to invite everybody to that virtual ribbon cutting. Um, and then I, I, I think the second part of the question was for you, Gina. I don't, I don't remember what it was. What was the second part of the question, Laura? Oh, sorry. It was about um, how, uh, how you all addressed specific city design standards. I think it was early on. It was really... Um, the phase three, Jeff, maybe you want to speak to what the constraints were around the, the phase three. For us, it wasn't, wasn't 
a really a challenge. It was really just about finalizing how many units would be allowed and the configuration. And once we had that, we could push on it. But Jeff, maybe you want to. Yeah. Um, so um, the, simultaneous with uh, redoing the conditional use permit process was redoing the administrative site and architectural design review. And, uh, you know, originally all of that was done with both phases together. So we, we did have to look at it differently and had to look at some changes, but it was keeping consistent with the single story um, approach. It was the, uh, the first phase still had some shed roofs and, and uh, kind of a modernistic design. Um, so th these modular units did fit into that. We, had, we did look at the exterior building materials that were being proposed. Uh, we looked at the decking and how they'd make connections to the walkways and the public sidewalk. Um, we did also work with blockables about um, having um, specific, uh, uh, you know, visual accessibility to the units in terms of where they were going to have windows and also to have individual coverings for the uh, entryways for each unit as well. So we did look at some of those details to make sure it met our specific design requirements. Um, because the city does require uh, architectural design review for any multifamily over a duplex. Um, so that was evaluated uh, leading up to the conditional use permit process. Jamie, to answer your question about, did you miss the picture of the final project? No, um, the project is almost done, but not quite. Um, and it, like Aaron said, I think that we'll put pictures up once we have the landscaping and things completed. So you didn't miss anything. Great, thanks, Gina. Um, next question is from Steve um, about how much equity in the project did Blockable receive? Blockable has no equity in this project. So, from a uh, the from the on the not for profit side, um, you know, we as a company, you know, we will do we we can develop as a not for profit. Blockable equity is not for profit developer, um, but in those projects, you know, as just as a, um, a philosophy and as a point of view, um, you know, anything that's publicly financed should be held by not-for-profit entity. And so anything that's publicly financed should be, should not have a private um, developer equity uh, component. So block, in this case, block owns nothing. We, we own nothing in the project. Um, going forward, we can develop, but we'll do, we'll do anything that's publicly financed through our not-for-profit side. Uh, next question is from Mike about uh, net zero envelope design, which he's excited to see. And the question is that um, given the steel framing, he's curious how the whole exterior wall assembly worked, especially for thermal performance. Uh, what size is steel stud? What's the spacing of the studs? And how was insulation handled? And then what was the whole wall R value? Yeah, so that's that's a whole level of detail that you know gets into other folks who work in our company who would you could spend all day talking with and talk with the folks at NREL. Um, so I'll give you two answers. One is it's magic, uh, and then two, um, all that stuff's also also our kind of proprietary you know secret sauce. So I'll, I'll tell you this: when the National Renewable Energy Lab has gone to all of the modular factories in the country. They work with a lot of different folks at different levels. Um, when they came to our factory and they looked at, so our, our lead, um, our director of building innovations, uh, name is Luke, and uh, he's an incredible, incredible um, sort of fabricator, but also uh, thinking about building performance um, for multifamily. And when they came and saw what we had built, he showed them the, the sort of build out of the envelope and they said it was the best assembly they'd ever seen. And so the assembly, um, you're asking all the, all the questions, all the right questions. It is exactly looking at how do you take, you know, a steel frame system that's going to be shipped out of the factory, 95% complete, that's going to have a mixture, you know, between the different tapes and adhesives and, and, you know, rain screen system and everything that's put on it. How do you create that assembly within intermodal standards in such a way that gives you the maximum 
our value. I can't tell you off the top of my head what the generic, what the, what the um, objective our value is in the walls. Um, all I can say is, is that, you know, the, the team did an incredible job in that phase of engineering and getting to where uh, we were with Auburn. But again, it's a prototype and we have challenges ahead of us for projects that we're doing in California to try and get to all electric. You know, how do you get to an all electric system given the sort of water heating requirements and so energy performance is going to be a constant uh, effort and it's a really big part of because one of the things that's happening particularly in California is really understanding the connection between housing affordability and energy performance right so you know the the they can't just create I mean they're 3.4 million units short of housing in California and they need to bring a lot of housing online and if they don't set the regulatory standards that's going to be a draw on the grid that they can't handle now so how do you design and build you know grid resilient grid interactive highly energy efficient housing that just on the face of it would cost more to build because of all those requirements that you're putting on it and at the same time deliver more affordable housing that is the question um, in a lot of regions but in particular california so that's what we're actually really closely working with nrel on is how do you systemize those problems so how do you system how do you pick you know the areas of repeatable building that are going to give you the type of energy performance that you're going to need and then also tie that together with the sort of cutting edge um, components that are coming online for mostly mechanical systems right where you're looking at because you have two parts to the problem the first is the envelope we built an efficient envelope because we know that the rest of it doesn't work if you don't have an efficient envelope so if you're trying to create more efficient hvac more efficient water systems more efficient if you've got a bad envelope like you're just going to have to crank more in to solve that problem so we started with the creating the efficient envelope but then the other part of it is the industry which is now starting to spend more on you know smaller mini splits more ener energy efficient um, at hvac systems more energy efficient water pumps Okay. Um, Marty threw out a question yeah, to the group um, about if there are municipalities represented uh, here that see a path for this methodology or strategy in your community. Um, and I'm going to skip Mark for a minute because he uh, asks a, a question and I'll uh, read Colleen's response from the city of Burien. So she says that maybe under our housing demonstration program, but land and financing might be a challenge, maybe partnership with faith-based. Um, and I don't know if either anyone wants to add to that or respond, otherwise I'll go to Mark's question. Feel free to unmute yourself. All right, um, so then Mark asks um, that as a demonstration project, Blockable essentially subsidized the development. So for future projects, what kind of cost or unit cost is a reasonable projection for a similar size project um, to be able to replicate this project in other communities? Well, again, it comes back to the fully loaded development cost per door. So we look at it a little differently where for our, from our perspective, you know, we're going into an engineering phase right now where a lot of the engineering work itself is designed to reduce costs of the overall development, right? So all of the, you know, how do you, how do you develop a system that's going to be lower cost to manufacture, lower cost to develop? So that's the phase that we're in right now. And then separately, we're in site acquisition mode. So for us, it's about acquiring sites um, where the development costs, um, and this is for market rate work, where the development costs um, will provide a, a solid return on the investment from a real estate perspective, which means we can you know, achieve rents um, that make the development costs uh, all pencil out and work out and become, become good development. So, I'll tell you this much on Auburn, um, despite, so I think I listed out a whole number of those delays that all resulted in us spending the, the time um, to get through those process. But with all of that, we were kind of astonished to find that even with that, our per door build cost was below 
um, most of the sort of primary markets on the West Coast. So even though we invented the entire thing as we were doing it um, and, and invented every process, documented it. So everything that we did probably took three or four times as long as we typically would because we were developing training materials, we were developing all the engineering sets, all of that was happening as we were building. Even with all of that, we were still below build costs in primary West Coast markets, which for us was astonishing because um, we didn't think that we, we would get the cost to that point. So we know where the, we know where the levers are. Uh, and then, you know, we did subsidize this project, but again, it was for a very different reason. And for us, it's not, you know, it's not the, this is, I think, the thing that a lot of the industry misses. If you're asking, if you ask in the initial phase, what's the per door cost? How many can you build? How long does it take? that you get the commodity. So you get the commodity input, which is the thing that the industry will build over and over. And the answer will just be, well, it depends on how much cheaper the materials and labor are if you put them in a factory relative to doing them on site. So it's not about the per door cost next year. It's about the per door cost the year after that, and then the year after that, and then the year after that. And you create a separation with what you can do from what the market can do that's on a trajectory that's gonna be really impossible to catch. So, uh, I mean, we certainly have our targets. We're not really sharing them at this point, um, but they are below market costs um, in all the markets that we're going to be working in over the next uh, two to three years. Okay. Uh, next question is from Emily. So you mentioned the bigger issue is the traditional approach to building housing units, not the amount of money allotted. And this sounds similar to the discussion of highway construction decades ago. Uh, the roads were intended to be temporary. Do you think the same can be said for other government funded buildings at large and would blockable branch out into other markets in the future? Maybe in the future, but um, you know, housing is complicated and housing is the problem. And we started the business, you know, um, for the, for this purpose. So there's a lot, we get calls all the time. We get calls from, you know, people who want to build like gas station offices or people who want to, you know, they want to build, um, you know, all kinds of different things. And we just, we don't respond to them. ADUs are a good example, right? A lot of people want to want to buy ADUs or put ADUs in place, but to us, it just doesn't move. It doesn't move. There aren't enough ADUs that are going to be built to make a substantial, you know, dent in the housing crisis. We look at it and say, well, the multifamily infill, is where you can achieve the maximum standardization, maximum cost reduction, and have a big impact on people having access to affordable housing, which is the reason we started the company. So that's the reason we have the two market approach. We have the market rate and the not-for-profit approach because both of them fuel scale. And as you fuel scale, you can drive down your cost, but you, you have, and we've, from our investors and from our board and from everybody who's involved, we're committed to the not-for-profit affordable housing side of it. That's a key part of what we're doing. So the housing market is very different than say the commercial buildings market or the ADU market or uh, high rises. There's a lot of different types. We're not, we're not really looking at any of those. The only thing I'll say is, you know, if you can build buildings um, at scale and if, if you can develop and build at scale with a manufactured approach, you can build anything. Then it's just a matter of what's what should you spend your time on? And so from the beginning, we were definitely focused on housing um, and, and permanent housing because, I and I think there's a, a place for all, you know, there's a, one of the things you see in the market is if you don't address the lower tier of the housing market, um, your need for things like temporary housing and shelter is just gonna continue to swell, right? Because you can't exit people out of those systems. There's nowhere to go in the market. Right, so if you can't exit people out of the shelters, that the need for shelters would just go bigger and bigger, and then you could say, well, we need more solutions for shelters. But that, that's not to us; it's not really the solution. Those are like, you know, things that we're doing because we can't get enough housing out there that that is at the right price. You know, I could go on for ages, but I mean, the only reason the only reason we have a subsidy system is because it recognizes the fact that there's you know a huge percentage of the population that simply can't afford market rents. Right, the market doesn't build enough housing, and doesn't deliver it at a cost that renters can pay. <laughs> so we have this entire world of like LIHTC subsidy that's created an entire industry around LIHTC 
that now we're saying the solution is spend more money there. And so that, that just doesn't, doesn't make sense. I mean, it, it's needed, but it's like building shelters, right? It's not the answer. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Mark has a question. Um, uh, given your experience with Auburn and Valley Cities, what recommendations do you have for how other cities and nonprofits can best engage with Blockable for projects uh, in contrast to the traditional affordable housing model? Well, I think we really distinguish, I mean, the Valley Cities is a great partner because Valley Cities is a, there's a service provider, right? So Valley Cities was the ideal partner because, you know, Valley Cities uh, focuses on behavioral health and they're a service provider. They're not a housing developer, right? So they've done housing development. And I think this is the situation that a lot of not-for-profits got into where they're developing housing because they need it. They need it to, to, to serve more people, right? So in order to serve more people, they have to develop more housing. They're not housing developers, but a lot of them become housing developers. The challenge becomes when, if you become a housing developer and then you get, you know, you get hooked on the developer fee, right? So then they're like, oh, wait a second, this developer fee is pretty attractive, right? So then all of a sudden that becomes the driving force behind developing housing. But Valley Cities is a service provider. So Valley Cities had a, a perfect site, right? Which they owned and was entitled and was stubbed with utilities and was very clear to develop. Um, and they're a service provider, which meant they weren't, they had no conflicts or, or, um, or aspirations to be a developer. So that made things very, very clear. So that's ideal for us where, you know, there's a, there's a need, there's a site, there's a service provider, right, who, who ideally controls and owns the site. For us, that's a, that makes it a much more straightforward path. Then you, then you just have to obviously then look for alternative sources of financing because the way that we finance housing, you know, in this state and in a lot of places wouldn't allow, wouldn't allow us to use public financing to develop that project. So it would, you know, that that's when, you know, but we have all, all kinds of ways that we can, we can work around that and we can push on that process. But ideally, you know, it's a not-for-profit service provider that has, um, has identified a site that they can contribute into the project um, that we can then, we can then push on. So that's it for questions in the chat. We have about eight minutes left, um, and I want to invite folks to um, either throw any last comments or questions in the chat or just unmute yourself um, and uh, make a comment or a question directly. Well, hearing none, um, Marty or uh, anyone from the project team, any last comments or thoughts before we close out today? I'll give Gina and Jeff a chance to respond if they'd like. Otherwise, I'll certainly always have something to say. Nothing for me. Just thank you, everyone. Good, great audience. It's great to have you all here to hear all of this. I think it's in, very innovative. And I would just add that I appreciate the opportunity for the city of Auburn to be involved in this. And it was exciting to have this prototype built in our community. It's uh, exciting to partner with Blockables and Valley Cities on seeing this come to fruition. Yeah, we really appreciate all of you in terms of really trying to find the breakthroughs. I see Scott Starr's face up there. Um, he's been diligently listening in. Um, Scott, anything you want to add? Hmm. Let's see, no, I don't think so. I think if I had to add anything, I'd say that um, people should, when they get the chance, check out the um, units um, either in the virtual, it's too bad it has to be a virtual um, ribbon cutting, but virtually or possibly eventually in person. Um, I think one thing we didn't talk about a lot in all the discussion about innovation and um, 
you know, uh, novel approaches to bringing the project to uh, um, completion is that the units are actually very high quality. Um, as someone who almost always works on affordable housing, I've rarely had a chance to uh, do something like a tiled bathroom um, or uh, use some of the higher quality fixtures that Blockable uses um, um, in their builds. So that was, it was really fun being involved with it. Um, and uh, um, I do think that people um, should uh, um, take the time to visit it or at least look at it online. Scott, I don't want to put you on the spot and we're running out of time, but um, Aaron lobbed quite a bit of stuff out there today. Mm -hmm. um, you've been in the industry a long time, the sector, working with the traditional methodologies. Any reactions to how he flavored it? Well, I don't know what you're exactly looking for, but um, I think that that a lot of the criticisms that um, that um, you know Aaron has about the the sort of the the way things are done apply to both the the for profit and the non profit sector. And um, if you go and read the article that um, that um, I've I've seen recently from Blockable, a lot of their um, a lot of the critique in the articles about the for profit um, sector. Um, and, you know, if you look at the kind of just how we produce housing in this country, clearly it's not doing the job. Um, and I think it's, there's, there's, you know, you can say that there's some blame to be put on the, the nonprofit sector, but I think there's also a lot of, a lot of this is that the for-profit sector isn't really meeting the needs of everyone in the community. Um, and it's, it's kind of been that way for a while now. Um, so I think that, that, um, everyone has some critiques about how housing is produced and, and distributed in this country. Um, yeah. so I, you know, I think that, that we do, and everyone knows that we do have kind of a clunky system of, of financing these projects, um, you know, from the way that we have to apply for funding and how funding rounds are done. Um, and all the hoops that you have to jump through um, in order to get the funding and take it and build your project. Um, it's, it's cumbersome. So I think that, that a lot of those, you know, critiques are things that, you know, phrased in, in, you know, many different ways we'd all generally agree with. Yeah. Well, I just want to uh, applaud you, Aaron, for getting up on the balcony and turning up the thermostat. Um, I think it's essential. Um, uh, to Scott's point, we tend to, um, all of us, uh, myself included, look at challenges uh, as technical problems and we get out our toolboxes and we tweak and we think we can fix. And this is really an adaptive problem scale and magnitude of what needs to happen, we don't have the answers for. We have to find those answers. And it's gonna require people with the guts and the courage to go out there and, and do what you're doing. So I applaud you for that. I um, hope that more of you will continue the buzz of what you've heard today and uh, try to uh, entice your local municipalities and others to say, um, let's invite a conversation about this. Can we do something in our community to push this forward? And I'll leave you finally with uh, one of my favorite quotes you many of you may have heard before. Eo Wilson, the biologist said, the real problem with humanity is that we have medieval institutions, paleolithic emotions and godlike technology. So take that with you uh, and uh, final round of applause and thanks to Aaron and the team for today's presentation, Lauren for making it all possible. And I look forward to many more conversations about what Blockable is doing and what we're all doing to try to change the dynamic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.